Hello, and welcome to Responsible Fintech, a program from Fintech Circle and ITN Productions. In this program, we'll be looking at sustainability and green finance, and the role the fintech sector is playing to help reach the government's net zero targets. I'm joined now by Suzanne Chisti, CEO of Fintech Circle. Suzanne, welcome. Thanks, good to be here. Uh, now, the title of this programme is Responsible Fintech. Just talk to us about why uh, now is the time to be focusing on that. Yeah, Responsible Fintech is all about responsible leadership. So we spoke a lot about corporate social responsibility. And the key to Responsible Fintech is that financial services companies and technology companies, no matter their size, want to pursue other objectives now in addition to maximizing their profits. And so ESG has become a key focus. You know, the environmental criteria, which have been discussed heavily during the United Nations Climate Change Summit, COP26. And those goals are how can companies become a steward of nature? Number two, it's about social criteria. How can companies work with suppliers, their clients, their employees in a better, more sustainable way? And thirdly, it's about governance about leadership, about social inclusion and diversity. And of course, as part of responsible fintech, we look at ESG investing. And ESG investing is an area of enormous growth. Bloomberg projects that in 2025, more than $53 trillion will be invested in ESG assets globally, which will make it a third of all assets under management. So that's why we focus on responsible fintech with this film, because we believe it has got the power and the potential to change the world. Well, let's pick up on one of those uh, strands that you were talking about, the environmental side. What can be done to make the sector greener? Uh, to make the sector greener, one of the key starting points is to measure our carbon footprint. And that's a very difficult one because it's not easy to know what the carbon footprint is which we as individuals have got and which companies have. Knowing your carbon footprint is the first step to improving it. Because then you know it's like a dashboard, you know where you are and you can improve it afterwards. And of course one goal, the key goal must be to reduce our carbon footprint, but the second goal is to offset it. If you can't reduce it, you at least want to offset it. We hear a lot about cryptocurrency and the environmental concerns surrounding it. How green is cryptocurrency and what can be done to make it greener? Yeah, I mean, the cryptocurrency industry has been growing enormously, as have the concerns about its environmental impact. They're almost energy intensive by design because millions of computers globally mine. And so the issue is that investors and those enthusiasts who believe in a decentralized economy and believe that cryptocurrencies might be the future of finance have got the issue that the industry has got a bad track record in terms of climate change. However, the good news is that this is being addressed slowly. So we see new developments for new cryptocurrencies are being designed using much less energy and less electricity. So the, the Crypto Climate Accord seeks to decarbonize the industry and achieve net zero emissions by 2030. Let's talk about the future. Uh, when you think of the future, what's on the horizon? The impact of new technologies on new markets, on business, on society is huge. So when we think about in 2021, the, even the first half, we had almost $100 billion being invested in the fintech sector. So what we see is a strong interest by investors to invest and be exposed to this growing and booming fintech sector globally. And in the future, we see developments such as platform-based business models, super apps becoming key themes where more companies focus on those areas. We see large tech companies, all the household names, developing partnerships with banks to create digital banking accounts and in order to service existing clients. And finally, a trend for 2022 will definitely be that we focus even more on green fintech, green finance and financial inclusion. Lots uh, to look forward to. Suzanne Chisti, thank you so much. Thank you very much for having me.
Fintech is a growing sector with entrepreneurs and startups helping to make transformational change. We went to find out how businesses are developing sustainable finance to support a growing industry. As we all move towards living our lives completely online, we're increasingly using technology for our financial services on our phones, on all our devices. But how green are fintech companies and why is that important? Here at London Business Club Homegrown, entrepreneurial pioneers rub shoulders with investors and business leaders. They know that the way we transact is changing all the time. Digitalization means the number of financial technology companies, or fintechs, is increasing fast, as is the pressure for ethical investment. Europe alone last year had 505 green funds being launched. From a customer point of view, one in three customers in the UK alone are now, have now decided to switch to green financial services or pre green financial providers. From an employee's point of view, 60% of the global millennials and the Gen Zs have stated that they will only work for a company that clearly states how positively they are impacting the environment and the societies that they operate in. Communique is one of the partners of FinTech Circle, an organization that helps startups to innovate and grow. Startups have got the power and the potential to disrupt the status quo, and we call this transformational innovation. Yet many of them fail, and the CEO of FinTech Circle advises that one route to survival is responsible finance, and to focus on the three principles of ESG. One is about environment, how to become a steward to nature. Number two, it's about social impact and how to deepen, how to improve relationships with your employees, your clients, the communities you serve, your shareholders. And number three, it's about governance, how to run the business in a more sustainable way, focus on diversity, focus on inclusion, for example. I think it's all about the conversation. And of course, when investors are viewing possibilities and opportunities, this dimension of green hasn't always been at the forefront, but to say that actually I'm going to put my money into something that is actually having a better impact on the environment is a bold move. And I think we need more investors to be bold. As a hedge fund, I think it, we're quite lucky in the sense that obviously we're small and nimble. And so actually we're able to do a lot more and get a lot more through, you know, really know who our customers are, really know who our service providers are, do our due diligence. As well as reducing their own carbon footprint, fintech companies can help us measure and reduce ours. And if you can't reduce it, you can offset it. And there are all sorts of fintech companies out there and fintech apps which help you to offset your carbon footprint. One example is car insurance. You can sign up to fintech apps which allow you to offset part of your driving. Fintech is really prominent in Africa at the moment. Why? Because the majority of Africans don't have access to bank accounts. They don't have access to ATMs. So what is the, but, but they all have a mobile phone. And because of that, they're actually able to utilize and use the technology of payments and loans. But can fintech companies reduce their high level of energy consumption? When we look at the cryptocurrency space, which has been criticized of ignoring climate change in the past, that they are also moving in the right direction by trying to create new cryptocurrencies which lose, lose, uh, use less energy. And also the Crypto Climate Accord has got as a target to reduce and decarbonize the industry and achieve net zero targets by 2030. With FinTech transforming financial services at a time when parts of our planet are becoming uninhabitable through climate change, it's imperative to put sustainability at the heart of their business. Cryptocurrency is an alternative to our current financial system, and its users have been growing each year. But for some, it's still unfamiliar territory. 
Yield app is helping to enable the everyday person to invest at the touch of a button, thanks to their innovative web platform, helping their customers to learn and to build a secure financial future with minimal risk. Cryptocurrency is essentially like the evolution of money and what I think is important about DeFi is it essentially allows everybody to become their own bank. Lucas Kiley has spent his entire 25-year career in banking, a career that's taken him all over the world. He's worked in both the private and investment sectors, predominantly as a trader, but the most rewarding so far, by far, is Yield App. Yield App is a platform that enables all users to have access to world-leading investment ideas and investment opportunities. It's there to kind of demystify cryptocurrency investing and we believe we've got a, a great platform that allows every, everyday users to come along and deploy their, their, their cryptocurrencies and, and earn a yield on that. Yield App allows anyone to invest in decentralised finance at the touch of a button. It was set up in February 2021 and already has 65,000 clients worldwide who've invested half a billion dollars of digital assets. It's flexible, rates and rewards update within seconds and it's also simple to use and accessible to all. How important is it that everybody has access to these investment opportunities? The thing that springs to mind first of all is empowerment and being able to control your money, how you invest your money, what you do with that money, be it for children's education, be it for medical uh, insurance or medical bills or you know, planning for holidays or retirement is really important and I think often we lose sight of the fact that when we just put our money in a bank or in a, an investment fund, we don't really know what it's doing, we don't really know how it's performing and sometimes it's not performing at all. Whereas being able to use our platform and see your money grow, I think is, is, is a really empowering and uh, it's, it can be life changing for some people. How easy is it to get started? First of all, the, the process to get set up on our platform is, is very, very easy. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. You open your account, you go through the, the, the document checks or verification checks of who you are. It's, it's actually you who you say who's doing the investment. And then once you deploy or, or uh, move, your, move your crypto assets to, to the wallet on our platform, you can choose to, I want to invest those assets. And that's it, that simple. The minimum deposit for Yield App is low, $100 or around £75, meaning access to the best investment opportunities is accessible to more people. Returns can be up to 18%. There is a misconception that you need a vast amount of money to, to, to get started, but you don't. It's, it's a minimal amount and as you start to, to invest that small amount of money, you start to see it grow. It helps you build confidence in what you're doing and confidence and control, I think, are, are very empowering. Digital assets and cryptocurrencies remove barriers. For example, when transferring money to developing countries, the banks take a large slice. This isn't the case here. On a personal level, I watched uh, living in Hong Kong, domestic helpers send, their, send their, their earnings or salary home to their friends and or family, children they're supporting, and the amount of money that would arrive in the Philippines or Indonesia would be a lot less than what they sent, and that's because of the, the slippage along the way. This platform and, and cryptocurrency in general allows greater control of your of your wealth and how you transfer those the, the money abroad to, to friends, family, etc. And losing uh, a lot less of that money obviously is a great thing because the money is going to where you want it to go, not to where you don't want it to go. Those behind Yield App recognise that environmental considerations are critical, that green cryptocurrency is the way forward. Green cryptocurrency is obviously important. We all realise that the impact we have on, on our environment is you know, front and centre in everything we look at in all walks of life today and, and cryptocurrency shouldn't be any different. The old app is about accessibility and empowerment. At the end of the day, everybody wants to get control of their future and we feel this is a platform that allows you to do that. Carbon accounting is a key part of our net zero journey, and open banking platforms are playing a surprisingly crucial role in this. Founded in 2012, Tink empowers businesses to provide clear data to their customers on their carbon footprint and ways to be more sustainable. I'm delighted to welcome Rafa Plantier, Tink's head of UK and Ireland. Uh, Rafa, thanks for being with us. Thank you for having me. 
Uh, financial services and particularly financial technology can feel to a lot of people like a very complex area. How do you make it simple? Yeah, I would say financial services is, is conceptually simple in the way that people understand what a transaction or what a mortgage is, but it's operationally complex. Actually getting a mortgage or remortgaging is incredibly difficult. And I would say for all, ultimately it, comes, it has two big problems. One is a data mobility problem. It's very hard to get your transactional history from you know, your current bank provider to a potential, you know, mo your mortgage partner. And it's very, it, there's also a, data, a computational issue to make sense out of all of this data. And this is, th this is our space. How does Tink's offering support our collective journey to net zero? Yeah, we're very proud of uh, one of our, our partner, the Northwest Group announced that during COP26, their carbon tracker uh, in, in app solution. So if you're you uh, a Northwest app user, you can check it out. We are the partner that goes from the, helps Northwest go from the raw data to enrich data so that another partner, Kogo, who's the eco expert here, can say, okay, this is the carbon that I can, the carbon emissions that I can derive from these transactions. And that is, a, I think, a fantastic example of, of open banking delivering like something that was never possible before, which is like a, a, a real time assessment of um, your, your, your carbon emissions by, by the decisions that you've made, the parties you've transacted with. And if we look to the future, what are you most excited about, particularly when we, when we talk about sustainability? I'm really excited about the expansion of this data pool. So as I mentioned, like we, we, we help people make sense of their financial data. That actually means data that sits on what we call payment accounts, because that's what PSD2 regulated over. But people's financial lives include mortgages, pensions. Um, so we're, we're on this journey of moving from open banking to what we're calling open finance. And that's really exciting because that that's that is some of that encompasses some of the most important financial decisions, decisions that people will make in their lives. Um, I'm also excited about, from a carbon perspective, being able to get from what we call SKU level the actual itemized um, carbon impact of each uh, thing you buy, all the way through the supply chain, from the from the manufacturer to the to the supermarket to, to whoever is delivering what we call scope one, two, and three emissions, like the upstream and downstream, all the way to the mobile app so that you know, consumers and business can make um, better decisions from a, from a carbon emission perspective. So mm -hmm. a lot, lot to come. Yeah, certainly a lot to come. Rafa Plantier, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Open banking is transforming the world of payments for consumers, businesses and financial institutions. Launched last year, Ordo is at the heart of this transformation, harnessing the power of open banking to provide low-cost, safe and easy real-time payments. Beautiful, sweet, seedless grape, the last of them now, 2 for 150. From cash to cards to apps, the world of payments has seen a massive shift over the last few decades. And these three tech company co-founders are at the forefront of the next big leap, open banking. Our future is being part of a world where open banking is probably not even talked about because that's just the way people make their payments. They'll expect to make a payment from their bank account to their business, the businesses they're dealing with. They'll expect it to happen in real time and they'll expect to look on their account and say, yeah, that's the payment I made just now. Banks must now share their customers' financial info with other FCA authorised providers and importantly for this tech company, let them set up payments on their behalf as well. This levels the playing field between traditional financial services providers and new disruptors. Ordo is FCA regulated. It provides a payments platform for businesses that allows them to collect money from their customers. Buying online, customers are taken to their bank to authorise payment directly from their bank account. No typing in long card numbers. Ordo sends these payment requests across its secure platform only and so the consumer will get a secure email link or an SMS link or a QR code and usually from a business that they're expecting to pay. The UK pioneered the adoption of open banking globally. Ordo is part of this revolution, founded by the former executive management team of the Faster Payment Scheme, the UK's own world-leading instant payment service. 
we started again with the very efficient faster payments service and built on top of that to provide a service that's much lower cost to businesses. The underlying technology is real time, which means when you move money, it goes from A to B in milliseconds. That is an advantage for businesses, which is rather than waiting days or weeks for money to come through from say a card company, it's there in their account the moment the customers pay for it. And then the final thing is, we just think it's easier to use. You don't have to exchange card details. You don't have to type in references when you're making a payment. And that ease of use makes it more efficient for everybody and delivers benefits for both the business collecting money and the customer paying their bill. We're working with a technology systems company in the energy market. So at the moment, some people, they may be on prepayment meters and they actually pay the most for their energy. And sadly, there's often the people that are on lower incomes. So open banking gives a real inclusivity solution because using open banking makes prepayment meters even cheaper than direct debit. Open banking also helps to save time. Businesses spend nearly 10 hours per week on payments admin, which is their most hated part of running their own business. And how are people taking to open banking? What do they think of it? Think about where we came from. A couple of years ago, people were not doing their banking on their phones. They were not looking at their apps on their phones. Now that's completely natural. That's really important for Auto because it means this is a natural process. And for big billers, when they're sending out their bills. They shouldn't be afraid of sending out bills using requests. And what do you see for the future for open banking? We're at the beginning of the future now. So uh, businesses like Gordo and others have been running for around 12, 18 months. And we're just starting to see the takeoff in open banking payments. And I think that will grow rapidly over the years ahead. It's already being used by organisations like HMRC for tax collection and things like that. So we'll see lots of new use cases adopting there. Well, the UK led the way with faster payments and with open banking, and Auto is now looking to expand into Europe, Australia and North America. And then beyond that is for those repeated payments, as we're going to call variable recurring payments, where things like direct debit or regular visits to particular sites you visit online or shops you visit in person will also be paid for by open banking. With these new innovations, the world of instant, low-cost, secure banking is for everyone. Liquidity in international payments can often be invisible and inaccessible, which leads to inefficiencies and risk. RTGS Global have built an international payments infrastructure suited to the digital age, which will enable liquidity management to become more efficient and will dramatically reduce settlement risk. The world's biggest financial centres have revolutionised retail banking by embracing the latest technologies to transform the customer experience. The challenge now for wholesale markets is matching that momentum by changing the way they operate to make the international payments network fit for purpose in the 21st century. There's a huge amount of friction in wholesale cross-border payments, whether that be uh, through delay, whether that be through lots of correspondence along the way in transmitting money cross-border, and, and also the invisibility of liquidity. So banks will enter into transactions, paying one side of a transaction in the hope that the other side arrives, and that can be a few days apart. So we've got a very old legacy network that really stitches together the planet for cross-border payments. and. It's really time now to, to, to modernise that. This is our um, commercial bank portal. At RTGS Global's London offices, a new payments platform developed in partnership with Microsoft is providing the opportunity to revolutionise the movement of money in wholesale markets. So it's, a, it's an online web application that allows treasury functions of the bank to actually interact with the network and they can actually see where liquidity resides across the globe and they can interact with those other banks. This peer-to-peer -peer trading capability will enable orders to be raised and settled in real time. This is my available liquidity balance. I've signed in as the Commercial Bank of Leeds and I want to source some US dollars, so I don't have any. I want to get those on demand. Uh, I know the IBAN that I want to make an ultimate payment to uh, and I'm going to grab, I need 750,000 USD. You can see I've got an indicative rate come back and that's come back from my partnering bank that I've identified for, for US dollars as a commercial bank of Seattle. So what we're going to do is what we call a, a, an atomic lock or lock the transfer. We lock the liquidity at both ends. 
So what I'm going to do is carry out what we call an atomic settlement. And what that does is actually across the network, we now settle the balances at both uh, Commercial Bank of Leeds and the Commercial Bank of Seattle. So I now own those $750,000. So that's it, transaction complete? Transaction complete, yeah. It takes about 800 milliseconds from some of the largest parts of the globe. So New York to Singapore is where we benchmark that. Using the atomic lock replaces the need for stable coins, cutting friction in the system, as well as risk, time and cost. We've been working in collaboration with Microsoft for the last few years to build our global platform. Our platform sits within the Azure global cloud, so all of the, the safety and soundness and resilience that Microsoft bring to the fore. We run our entire network on the Microsoft Azure cloud. And then we run our ledger um, within their services. So as banks transact across our network, we maintain our ledger in order to show those transactions. So it's really the advent of new technology that's enabled us to, to bring together the globe to enable this to happen in milliseconds. Simplifying wholesale transactions also opens up opportunities for developing new products and services. Streamlining processes also reduces risk and has the potential to make markets more sustainable. There's been uh, a lot of research in this space by the G20 over the last couple of years. The Financial Stability Board have pulled together a plan, a call to arms if you like, to, to, to modernise, improve and de-risk the, the cross-border system, let's say. And RTGS Global, we're looking at bringing a solution to the market that we think enables all of those risks to go away. A point-to-point -point bilateral network, improving both visibility and accessibility across liquidity markets. We're taking all of the aspects of what works today, payment versus payment. We're taking central bank money, so using reserves on our network that are supported by central bank funds, and also the adherence to the principles for financial market infrastructures, the PFMI, using those principles to build a safe, solid, resilient framework around all of that but bring in some innovation to it. So bring in new technology, enabling instant peer-to-peer -peer settlement. But it's preserving all of the things that we hold dearly in financial services today. Determined to change the car insurance industry for the better, Marshmallow is using wider data analytics to help give customers a better, fairer and cheaper service. Here's an animation to explain more. There is a shake-up of the insurance industry. The Financial Conduct Authority is picking up the pieces and rebuilding it to make it fairer to stop people being overcharged. Almost everyone needs insurance for their car, their home or their life. A person without a credit history needs to drive to work, an unemployed person still needs to buy groceries and an expat without a local driving licence needs to pick up their kids from school. Some traditional insurers judge you on impersonal and outdated systems, so if you don't meet their criteria, they either won't quote or they ask for lots of money. Marshmallow Insurance has technology that digs deeper to get a clearer, bigger view of the driver. This means they can offer a faster, fairer service to more people. And if you need to update or renew your policy, there's no hanging on the line, listening to annoying music. Everything is right there in your hand. A fully digital service, an app and 24-7 live chat to manage your journey from quote to purchase and even in the unfortunate event of a claim. They want to help make a better and safer driver and to reduce the number of accidents. That might mean warning of adverse weather conditions or making drivers aware of traffic and accident hotspots. Just like fintech shook up the banking industry with a digital revolution, Marshmallow Insurance aims to lead the way in InsureTech. By testing bold new ideas, the aim is to reduce the distress caused by accidents and keep drivers safe. And when joining, the first 500 miles of driving is carbon offset, allowing you to relax and enjoy life, knowing that the things you care about are protected. Welsh-based company Quote On Site is helping businesses to improve the efficiency and accuracy of their quotes by using their innovative cloud-based quoting management software. We went to find out how it works.
Here at this business park in Hampshire, people working in these offices will know that quoting for work can be a time-consuming and complex process, especially if you've got lots of customers. That's the case for Platinum Facilities and Maintenance Services, who have offices here and in London. They provide specialist mechanical and electrical services for maintaining office buildings for around 250 companies and send out around 7,000 quotes a year. Historically, they're all done on site, so they're done by lots of different people. And obviously, you know, if, if they weren't filtered down to us by the engineers, then, you know, those works would get missed. And then obviously we, we weren't as efficient as a company to get those works underway for the clients. So. With quotes ranging from 50 to £2 million, pounds, Platinum wanted to automate the process and chose a new cloud-based platform, Quote On Site. It allows them to create detailed quotes in minutes using their company-branded template and tracks clients' responses in real time. It's simple, it's quick, it's efficient. We change quotes quite often to include or exclude more data because it is a live system, it is live data. Anyone throughout the organisation can see that, um, whether they're remote working, whether they're home working, working out of London office, um, if they've stopped in lay by on their car, they can see it. It's all data that can be viewed in real time. Brainchild of husband and wife co-founders TJ and Elaine Amas, Quote On Site is a small technology startup based in Wales. TJ designed the digital tool to help small to medium-sized companies reclaim their admin time, close more sales and keep their clients happy. We help companies increase efficiency, increase professionalism and improve profits by just doing quoting better. So they can respond quicker to customer requests, you know, inquiries for quotation, they can present their brand in a good way and that way they kind of grow the business. So this is the home screen, create a quote, you simply pick what template you want to use, um, click create quote, specify who you're actually sending the quote to, it's got the branding, it'll allow you actually price up the, the job that you're quoting for. And using templates, you can have pre-populated pricing. And with Quote Insight, you can add imagery. So I can actually show the specification sections for that equipment just in a few clicks. And then you can preview the quotes. And when you're happy with the quote, you can email it from within Quote Insight. So this screen shows you your quote pipeline, where the orange column shows you your pending quotes. The black column shows you quotes that have been sent to the client, and the green and red show you accepted and rejected quotes. The sent quotes can have automated reminders sent to non-responsive clients. Once the clients receive the quote, they can click to accept or reject it. They can add notes along the way, they can ask us questions, and all that comes back in as a notification by email to us. So. They can also easily add like the purchase order numbers and things to the quotation once they accept it. So for them, rather than raising a physical purchase order, emailing it across to us, you know, whether that gets lost in translation somewhere along the line, it's just it's so straightforward for them and it's, it's really good. In the last couple of years, Platinum has doubled in size. The finance director feels that Quote On Site has helped with the challenge of rapid growth by standardising their processes and giving a clearer view of which way the company's moving and types of works required. It keeps that history. It keeps that dialogue there with the customer. We can see what they've accepted, what they've turned down. It doesn't ever disappear. It allows the customer to then um, take a look at something that maybe happened six months ago, come back to us and say, right, I've now got the budget to do that. Let's move on. With Quote on Site, we can look and say, well, it's given us our margin analysis. It's seeing who, who's spending what money where. It's given us a, a, a clearer view of the forthcoming business. The Quote on Site team work alongside their customers to continually modify the software. We're building this product not for ourselves, but for the businesses out there who are looking to grow and scale. And so we think it's a very important part of the process to really listen um, and to provide tools that meet the exact needs of our clients. An efficient company is a sustainable company. And by creating affordable and time-saving tools, companies like Quote On Site are helping both startups and established businesses to grow in a responsible way. One way to build stronger, more diverse communities is to support their financial institutions. Q2 is doing just that by offering a single platform that unifies a lender's technology. The result is a simple, seamless, end-to-end -end experience for borrowers and lenders alike. 
We visited them to learn more. Q2 is well placed to support growth in a post-pandemic landscape where conducting personal and business finances online is the norm for many. Its flexible cloud-based model attracts a wide range of clients from high street and challenger banks to niche finance providers who are spearheading financial innovation. But I think the, the most exciting area of the space that we work in, the most innovative, the most energised area, is the alternative finance space. Uh, and that's where we find our solution fits particularly well, is received particularly well, uh, and it's an area that seems it's been quite dynamic over the last two or three years. When you compare what Q2 are doing versus some of the larger banks and the systems they're using, I'd compare it to uh, like an oil tanker in that their systems are legacy systems, large and complex systems that over many, many years have been layered with a range of different rules and connections, whereas with Q2 we were able to start at a blank page, have a modern system that was cloud-based, fully connected, that allows us to do things quite differently to, to some of the traditional banks out there. Noma is a specialist lender responsibly providing interest-free loans to adults seeking vocational skills. We're a fintech, we're trying to do things a bit differently and we're trying to actually be on the side of the consumer and ultimately everything that we do comes back to trying to protect our end user, the, the, the student, the borrower, to ensure that they can access the finance in a fair and sustainable way. We look to align with customers who actually align with our own mission, which is about building stronger and more diverse communities by strengthening their financial institutions. And in fact, in the fintech space, we work with a number of customers who are actually innovating on traditional finance and helping people get access to credit who wouldn't normally, or those that feel underbanked. Thanks to Q2's digital technology, people can get access to credit more easily and get decisions more quickly. Our customers are able to create very unique experiences for themselves and also for their, their customers, the end borrowers essentially, which aligns with the values that they, they also have. So for example, they can create an online application where uh, borrowers can get a decision within minutes rather than days or months, which has traditionally been the case. Borrowers are savvy, are younger, are tech-enabled, and therefore they are used to having that seamless experience, that frictionless experience. So why should the lending experience be different? Q2 are also expanding their offer by collaborating with other companies to ensure businesses which struggled during the pandemic don't lose out businesses might have incurred in losses, but that does not determine what their repayment capabilities will be going forward. So we're expanding that type of analysis and there are you know, credit rating agencies as well that are developing unique algorithms to analyze in a new way what the borrowing potential will be. And I think that's a very exciting part of being Q2 because we not only offer that end-to-end -end journey but we also have all of these third parties application that we work with that are innovators themselves. Q2 sees the biggest challenge in fintech as consolidating a fragmented sector but their main mission is making financial help available to everyone. There is a huge amount of market share out there. We, we see ourselves working more closely with the innovators. We see ourselves being more closely aligned in being able to help and assist the market consolidate, bring new ideas to market and just be a little bit more involved at the front end of the technology in, in helping accessibility. Thank you for watching Responsible Fintech. All of our reports are available to view on the Fintech Circle website. The details are on the screen now. From me and the team here, thank you for watching, and we hope you enjoy the rest of Fintech Connect.